everybody, and welcome back to You Can't Win. This is Tom here, and I'm joined by Don, as usual. Today, we're going to be talking about, well, this idea I've been kicking around, uh, trying to sort of conceptualize certain things about how I think about the world, like uh, on a kind of macro scale, I guess. That, that sounds extremely pretentious. Uh, I was basically just thinking about organized crime and the idea that there is a vast shadow economy slash power structure that is kind of like hidden from us in mm-hmm. a lot of ways. Like we tend to focus on nation states and stuff like the UN and kind of these big global institutions or national institutions and, you know, things like that. And that's definitely like, I think part of how the world plays out, you know, these are major players. They definitely matter. Uh, but I, I think there's like a, a very powerful and important aspect to the way things work in the world that we don't really think about or see very often um, it, that that deals with crime, specifically like highly sophisticated organized crime, uh, intelligence operations and agencies, things like that, mm-hmm. uh, money laundering and banking. I think all of that, there's a kind of like the, the meme with the iceberg you know, where you have like the little thing poking out of the water and that talks about Enron and, uh, you know, the 2008 bailout and stuff like that. And then I think there's a very deep iceberg underneath it that, you know, get down deeper and deeper. And, uh, I, I I don't know. I, I just think that the amount of money floating around in things like drugs and guns and smuggling just in general it doesn't even have to be anything exciting tvs and whatever sure. uh human trafficking all that kind of stuff i th- i think uh it's very possible to me like it seems plausible that that economy may at least equal the size of the real economy quote unquote real economy uh if not uh, it could it could be bigger and uh i think that that has implications for the power structures around that too, you know? Like if if there's an economy that equals the size of the real economy, then there's probably a power structure that equals the potency of the real power structure, so to speak. Um, yeah, I guess it would have to depend on how you're defining it. I don't I don't know about that that size of the scale, but it, at the very least it's like within the sectors or something like that it is kind of there's something like that where like you know, like there's more drug, illegal drug revenue in the United States every year than there is, say, like revenue for Disney or something like that kind of thing. Right. Like it's corresponding. I mean, there's some basic things that just have to be the biggest, like uh, housing or something like that kind of thing. But like if you sort of hive off some of the things like housing and energy and stuff like that, then uh, yeah, like the kind of things that we think of as core of big businesses and stuff like that uh you know like restaurant business or something like that probably have uh sort of like vice equivalents where they're just like just a huge amount of money is going into them like uh you know if you think of like sex work as like a whole constellation of things like uh pornography and prostitution and all these things like that's probably you know as like a leisure service or something like that in the economy, like that's probably comparable in scale. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not specifically only talking about things like drugs and, and like criminal kind of the criminal economy in that sense. I I also like, I think money laundering is huge. Um, like, uh, okay, well let's, let's get into the, to the book. Um, so when I got this idea, I just started reading this book that I've sort of had on my kind of to read list for a while. And I didn't like expect to get very far into it. But this morning I got like 100 pages into it. It was just kind of is very interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's called All is Clouded by Desire. And it's written by Alan A. Block and Constance A. Weaver. Um, Alan Block is a very good scholar on this kind of stuff. He has done studies on uh, BCCI and, uh, Castle Bank and things like that. If, if anybody's familiar with that kind of thing, you'll maybe get an idea of what this is all about. Um, so 
what this book is really about, it's about, well, the subtitle is Global Banking, Money Laundering, and International Organized Crime. Um, So far, it's outlined the way that some pretty major scandals have played out and all the players in them. And it's pretty interesting just how this, like he, he's able to describe a kind of network of people who are doing favors for each other, making money with each other, and they span the entire the, the entire globe. Um, and there are people in high places, people in low places. Uh, a lot of them are intelligence connected, especially American intelligence and Israeli intelligence. Um, there's Russian um mafiosos there's people who they're not exactly criminals but they're kind of like just sleazy kind of like doing shady stuff in different places indonesia is one place he talks about quite a bit um iraq is another one uh it's it's almost seems like the way that this reads that certain countries are basically set up as middlemen for all these kinds of little schemes like Oman Mm -hmm. is one that was essentially kind of it it, kind of looks like there's a it's almost like they have some kind of deal where it's like you have your nominal independence you get to enjoy some measure of wealth and and whatnot but you have to kind of play ball with us when we want to negotiate this deal with Iraq around a pipeline they don't want to be seen talking to Israelis or maybe they just don't want to talk to Israelis on principle or something Um, but the money and the interest is Israeli that it wants this pipeline so they go through Oman things like that Mm -hmm. Um, the Indonesia stuff was was really fascinating because it kind of talks about how the CIA was funding and supplying these right-wing folks in Indonesia, these anti-communist types, and uh, you know there was the a kind of slaughter of of thousands, of, I forget the numbers, but like huge numbers of communists in mm-hmm. Indonesia. Yeah, and then eventually a, a coup that took over the country, and he he talks about not the not the president of of that coup or anything, but this kind of secondary character. Um, what was his name? Suwato Sutowo something like that. Sorry, my Indonesian. Not, I, mean, <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce these things. But anyway, it's this guy who was put in charge of the oil company, which was um, nationalized uh, from the Dutch. So that it used to be a Dutch colony. And then when they left, the oil company was nationalized under the name uh, Permina, which stands for something in Indonesian. And then this guy, who was sort of like a nobody it seems like he was like a uh a lieutenant or something and uh just met this dude Rappaport um Baruch Rappaport later he changed his name to Bruce Rappaport I think um who so this Rappaport guy was this Israeli sleaze bag basically he he seems to like travel all over the world he's friends with Shimon Perez eventually Mm -hmm. um he just has like kind of connections all over the place. He worked in like Haifa in the ports and um, was kind of able to like organize a racket there around smuggling and stuff. And then I think that allowed him to kind of expand. And uh, eventually he landed in Indonesia talking to this guy in a nightclub and they kind of schemed to set up this whole thing where this Indonesian guy uh, was able to climb the ranks and become the oil czar of the country and all of that oil money like the 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 main way that it seems that they would acquire money is by putting putting people or talking to people in positions of some kind of authority like that over say resources or over uh, loans and stuff and they would just take huge loans out against these things and um and just sort of like uh, do that, like billions of dollars uh, that would just come from God knows where exactly, I guess just from the uh, the treasuries and, and stuff of these countries or something. But, uh, you know, it was just people who were in, it, it reminded me actually of uh, 
William Burroughs is junkie where he talks about doctors who would just write prescriptions for things. Um, and it was just the fact that they had that pad and pen that gave them this power and like that every junkie always like the more, more valuable than the actual drugs itself was that, uh, that pad and pen. Mm -hmm. Uh, that, that's what this kind of reminded me of. It's like the people who are able to write down this loan is approved for this reason, or like to describe the nature of a loan or whatever. Those are the people who are like the key players in all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's all this, uh, they, they're constantly making like shell companies or, or whatever, you know, like they set up a company that they're ostensibly in control of something or they there's some reason that they would have some value economically and then they take out a bunch of loans people are investing in it a lot of it's coming through places like saudi arabia or whatever and uh then at some point like people start to scrutinize the the books and it falls apart they pay a fine but it's uh, you know a measly bit in comparison to what they've been able to extract and then they just move on to the other thing and this just happens all over the place and it's just crazy to think about something like the national oil company of a place like indonesia which has like a great wealth of oil uh that so much it it's more than the value of those resources because they're taking loans against it in huge sums you know so Mm -hmm. it's not it's not like they're just able to make money by selling the oil and that's it but all these people you know there's like half dozen to a dozen or so people involved and they all get 10 percent of something that is like 10 times the value of the actual resources so they're just making huge amounts of money and then they take that and go on to the next thing so Mm -hmm. um, when i was talking earlier about like the possibility of this sort of shadow economy being larger than the real economy this is the kind of stuff that i'm thinking of it's not really like i don't think that these things in and of themselves are just um you know that much more valuable than like the basic goods that like billions of people around the world need i think it's just the the fact that we can just say someone has billions of dollars on the basis of these like weird little loan schemes and stuff um i think that's how that works you know Mm -hmm. yeah like there's just huge pools of this money being hidden away in different places and, yeah, uh, like a, and it, on some level, it's almost like fictional, you know, because sure. like what I don't know, like what does it actually mean? It just it, it's just numbers in a computer that are attached to a bank account, and you have access to the bank account, so then you have all this money. You know, it's not like it needs to be anything other than that. And so, if you just get people who are able to make that happen for you, then it happens, I guess. Sure. Hmm. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so what, like, what else is in the book uh, related to this? Um, so they talk about the, um, so I, I talked about Indonesia, I talked about um, Rappaport. So this Bruce Rappaport guy is like a pretty consistent character through the book. Uh, he was involved with the Bank of New York scandal, which was something I was not super familiar with. Mm -hmm. But it seems very similar to BCCI, which is something I know a little bit more about. Um, BCCI was the bank in Pakistan that was essentially just laundering money for all kinds of like, like terrorist type stuff, you know, Al Qaeda Mm -hmm. type stuff. Um, And a lot of that money was coming from U.S. intelligence things. Uh, So like the that's another thing that he goes into, I guess, is the that especially people like um Paul Halliwell who was a early CIA guy he he started off in the OSS and then was a major part of the transition to the CIA mm-hmm. uh he uh he essentially so he started off as like an ambassador um i forgot what country it was it was something important <laughs> um yeah, I forgot what country he was an ambassador to. Uh, but after he re- he retired, quote unquote, from the OSS and became a lawyer, uh, working in just like corporate law and stuff mm-hmm. in his own firm. Um, but it, it, he spent the rest of his life just starting banks, uh, especially in the Caribbean. So there's sort of the the common notion, I think, of like um, 
offshore banks and how like, uh, oh, people do this so they don't have to pay taxes and stuff like that. I think the taxes are like a minor part of it. I think uh, it's more of a the obscurity of the transactions, like not being able to be audited, people not being able to like really see where money is coming and going and stuff. I think that he was essentially operating. Um, he was retired technically, but I don't. I don't think that someone like that actually really retires. You know, I think he was still kind of sure. working for yeah for these same intelligence agencies and starting these these banks in order to launder money. Because a lot of these laundering operations, it's not just to make like these these crooks, these like kind of small time guys rich. That's not really the big movement behind it i I think there's things like trying to fund operations and stuff like that so there are certain uh laundering operations here that were pretty explicitly in internal documentation set up to fund certain things um i think in indonesia one of those things was that yeah the uh this is where um edwin uh wilson who was a sort of a famous CIA guy, um, set up certain things about shipping and uh, import-export and stuff like that. That, you know, there's some part of it is is just legitimate business and whatnot, but a lot of it is, is also smuggling, illegal, whatever, you know, who knows what it is. Oil, probably a lot of it. And... Mm. Um, you know, that was used to, like, fund those right-wing movements in Indonesia, for example. Um, there's similar things around um, the IRA is another thing he gets into. The uh, So so it's kind of interesting, like, um, you know, we tend to put the IRA more on the left side of the spectrum, I guess, compared mm-hmm. to... Them. So, like, these, these networks don't really have a bias... St- like, well, I guess they do have a bias to the right, but it's not a strict sort of thing. You know, it's they don't like care too much. You know, it's just people who are trying to make some kind of thing work, some little scheme work. And um, whoever's willing to participate, it seems like it's kind of open invitation, I guess. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, so like the IRA was... Uh, funding a lot of its stuff and laundering money through some of these banks that were set up by CIA guys and whatnot. And um, the money in large part was coming from marijuana sales in Bo- the Boston area, mm-hmm. like uh, Whitey Bulger, for example, sure. a big part yeah. of that. Mm-hmm. Have you seen that movie about him, Black Mass? Uh, no, I haven't seen that one. I mean, the um, the Scorsese thing, which one was it? The Departed is kind of about like the Jack Nicholson character is basically like a Whitey Bulger yeah type. It's pretty interesting. Mhm. Yeah. Um But yeah, sure. you know, yeah. Swiss banks um all you know, all this kind of stuff we we think about as being like, oh, they're very secure banks. And that's why you know, that's why they're so highly esteemed and whatnot i i think a lot of it more has to do with like they need to kind of have a reputation for being that way in order to do the things that they're really doing you know deutsche sure. bank is another one he doesn't talk about deutsche bank in this but um that is a is a story that has come up over and over again of like just money laundering on a huge scale where it's like a whole country's gdp is just like you know miss a uh, misaccounted and uh sure. yeah it's just it's just wild uh what do you think about these like new leaks that have come out with all the different you know like uh accounts uh of uh rich people and whatnot hiding away money yeah i haven't um like looked very carefully at it but i guess a lot of it is just uh various politicians um and leaders and stuff with uh their own property it seems a lot of it has to do with real estate Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that's really the only I haven't looked at it too closely. I kind of assume that any of these types of leaks are it's like limited hangout type stuff where like uh, 
they let some stuff out that maybe they have like a, a grudge against somebody or they, you know, somebody is because it's like Russian, you know, or whatever, or some like third world country where it's like, who cares if he gets in trouble kind of a thing. Like I saw one where it was, a, I think, a Nigerian politician or something like that. Some Somebody in Africa it was like, oh, we had $10 million in uh, real estate in uh, Miami or something like that. And it's like, is that that's the big scandal? Some African yeah. dictator has a few million of Miami property. Like, ooh, big deal. Sure. Um, so I, I sort of imagine that. I mean, th- that the the papers themselves may go further. I don't know. I haven't looked at it. But that was like the headline I saw. And I was like, okay, so either the papers are the limited hangout or this newspaper article is focusing on something that is pretty meaningless. You know, it, sure. like, you got to hit that billion to even. I think, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah to even mean anything at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I just thought I would kind of talk about that a little bit. Uh, I know I'm a little bit all over the place. Like I just kind of zoomed through this first part of the book uh, and it's very detailed. It goes into like all kinds of, he's trying to be very careful about his documentation and his evidence, you know, cause he's saying some pretty, you know, it veers on like if you, if you say this without really backing it up, it's just like conspiracy theory type stuff, you know. But sure. uh, I don't know. He he sort of uh, this Alan Block guy, him and uh, Peter Dale Scott sort of seem like on the same wavelength as far as like the follow the money type guys mm-hmm. who take that pretty seriously. Yeah. Um, we had talked a little bit before we rec- started recording about like how, you know, the politics of this kind of stuff you had said, and, you know, you just said a minute ago about like how it does sort of maybe tend right, but, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be that. I think that that's probably a lot of, uh, you know, what worries me to some extent about the, you know, late kind of Soviet period and all that kind of stuff and all the Eastern Bloc and stuff where uh, there was, you know, big black markets and big uh, sort of like corruption uh, connected to the leaderships in different ways, uh, indirectly or directly. And like, uh, it's funny because I think that there's this tendency for people to go uh, like, well, every country has a black market, basically, to some extent. So therefore, uh, you can't really, like, in the very sort of like back and forth like system versus system kind of silly debates that happen kind of thing. It's like, well, you know, capitalism has corruption, so therefore that doesn't make it better or something like that. That, you know, that's kind of like the silly way that it gets portrayed. But uh, if you're like a socialist and you want your society to run well, (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. it's like you need to know what you're, you need to have like a policy on that that's not just, well, we'll get the police to shut it down or something like that. Because, those are always very, very deep wells for basically like, you know, anti-politics kind of stuff almost or something like that. Like this uh, intelligence agencies can leverage them really well. And like, uh, you know, like it, it can it can very quickly overwhelm your entire politics. Uh, um, and not just that, but even as like an economist kind of thing, like uh, like the economics of the situation um you know if you want a planned economy you can't necessarily have a parallel second economy or at least you have to kind of account for that you know in some ways and uh i think people really discount that kind of as a thing um there is sort of this model of the soviet collapse where people go well it was like gangsters and uh you know right-wing politicians and uh, foreign spies uh, working together uh, and that the average person was pretty much on board with socialism uh, but, you know, didn't uh, want, you know, they wouldn't have wanted radical right-wing reforms but they got them because, uh, you know, the this sort of conspiracy against the government. And, you know, if you believe that, that's fine but, uh, it does say a lot about society, I think, you know, or like the 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 way that the politics work that like, you know, it, there wasn't like a hundred percent 
people didn't fight to the death to stop it, basically. Like, millions of people right. didn't. It, it wasn't like a civil war. Uh, to I mean, there, there was elements of that. There was minor elements of that in places like, say, the siege of the parliament and things like that in uh, um, uh, Moscow and stuff. But, like, it wasn't... Uh, it wasn't like another World War II to stop the collapse of the Soviet Union or something like that kind of thing. Yeah, it's kind of funny to think about the difference between the mobilization in World War II to fight the Nazis versus the way that the Soviet Union eventually collapsed. Yeah, like if you believe that. And it's funny because uh, Trotsky had this writing. I think I might have mentioned this before, but like Trotsky had some sort of thing where he said that like, you know, one of the reasons he said that like Stalinist Russia was still a worker state was that he said that like uh, if someone actually tried to like overthrow socialism like as you know like or at least like you know he, he I don't know if he would actually call it socialism itself but like the you know if if people tried to overthrow the worker state um, there would be this giant bloodbath kind of thing or something like that like it, like outright like just outright street fighting throughout the country. Until, you know, because basically because he was like, well, it'd be like trying to go, go back to feudalism from capitalism or something like that. Like it just it wouldn't make sense. It just wouldn't. It would be yeah. this total collapse. So there is this actually there are actually some Trotsky's movements that still think that Russia is a worker state because today that didn't happen. Yes, because it didn't oh. happen. So they're like, it's like, a, I don't know. I thought that was kind of like a funny way where it's like. You get trapped by your own logic in a way. Yeah. Think, so, um, yeah. Yeah. This book does go into the end of the Soviet Union and some of the yeah stuff that was being played out around there. Again, uh, Rappaport is a major player. Uh, he starts off in the late 80s. Um, you know, the Soviet Union was doing the the they were being more open to trade and stuff with the West and all that kind of stuff, you yeah. know? So he was one of the first guys to jump on it when there was only like 20 businesses or whatever involved, um, at the time. And he, he kind of like, yeah, took the, you know, took the initiative to kind of get moving on it very quickly. He spoke directly to Gorbachev. He arranged a meeting with him and uh, the, the one thing that this book doesn't get into, at least so far, is like how that works. How does somebody who is is born in Haifa starts working at a port and then is able to from that is able to kind of launch themselves to this like pretty internationally important position of being like this guy that is able to just talk to whoever he needs to talk to make things happen like that is not super clear so uh, yeah i don't know that's something i'd like to maybe learn more about maybe elsewhere this guy has other books so maybe he gets into that kind of stuff elsewhere but um yeah it, it kind of talks about how he's able to organize like the leadership of all these different companies that are going to be created to kind of like take over the old soviet enterprises and stuff um, they are able to obtain monopolies on things like shipbuilding and uh, various natural resources and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's it's pretty pretty interesting if you're into that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and it, it's amazing how quickly it, you know, was spun out into this giant program to do it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd also be interested in learning like to what extent. Was there pre-Glasnost uh, deals and stuff like this, you know? Sure. Um, and, and how did that play with, like, the the collapse? Like, was there some sort of big changing of the guard around that kind of stuff? Or was it people who had been kind of working that kind of angle previously? Were they able to, like, upgrade their situation as a result or or what? Um, the other thing that kind of sticks out is that it, it makes it pretty clear that you have to be very careful about the way that you think about these things. You can't like blob things together. Um, like if, if it's Americans, you can't just assume like, oh, well, all the Americans are against the, uh, you know, I, I, the point I'm trying to make is like, there are, um, 
you know, government agencies and stuff that are supposed to be examining these things and, and catching financial crime and stuff like that. And they they do do their job. They they do look into these things and they do um, shut down a lot of these sorts of uh, operations and banks and stuff. Uh, it's not like it's bought and paid for throughout the the entire institution. You know, sure. they don't they don't have like the whole thing in their pocket. Uh, whether maybe they could like they, if they wanted to, but it doesn't seem to be something that is the way that it works. So it, if somebody gets caught doing something, they, you know, they they don't end up going to prison forever, or being executed or something like they might in China or whatever. But uh, the thing shuts down and they have to start from scratch somewhere else. And that also seems interesting to me just because I think um, a lot of these people, they're not from elite backgrounds generally, you know, so that they're, they're mm-hmm. kind of like, there's something a little bit endearing about these people because they're sort of scrappy and resourceful and sure. uh, just like infinitely ambitious, you know, so you kind of have to hand it to them on that front, but they just have no apparent sense of morality at all. So they're just doing like the most awful things and don't care how many people die or suffer as a result. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty cool. I don't know. It's, it's cool to like learn about this stuff. I, I, the reason I really wanted to talk about this was because I think that Don has a pretty well-defined, uh, political worldview, or at least it's, it's a little bit clearer, like where he stands and how he looks at things. And, um, for me, it's not so clear, perhaps. I'm mostly just, like, making stupid jokes and stuff and saying things are dumb or whatever. So, I don't know. This this kind of book and, and things like this, this is the way I tend to more look at uh, political things today. I was sort of thinking uh, before we started, actually, like, perhaps I, uh, I like this kind of stuff because it allows me to still uh, learn things about how uh, learn and think about how the world works how power works and all that kind of stuff without adopting any particular political um like attitude towards it or whatever i can kind of be very detached from and just be like okay well these guys did this and this so um yeah i don't know i i I feel like that is perhaps one of the reasons why i like this kind of thing yeah, I think with like the sort of sports team politics that a lot of people get into, it's hard to sort of integrate this stuff into it because you either have to sort of attribute it all to the other side or something like that kind of thing, you know, or you have to, uh, um, you know, just sort of abandon this idea that like, uh, um, yeah, that your side isn't might might have been for a long haul kind of thing or something like that to win (laughs) kind of thing because there's always like astonishing reversals and destruction of movements and stuff like that uh and just huge amounts of power that are just out of the reach of or at least appear out of the reach of the general public kind of thing so if you're sort of like the kind of person that wants to go door to door uh you know organizing for something you know like being like we're gonna you know, I don't know, like, we need to build more social housing in our city or something like that, that kind of thing. It's like, yeah, but you start to think, well, yeah, but there's this overarching system where it's like, you know, billions flow in and out of here of like, shell companies building buildings and stuff like, uh, and, you know, like, there's bribes to develop from developers to the uh, council and stuff. Like, it seems almost like, uh, impossible to override that kind of thing, like the veto of both capital and the um, sort of like shadow government kind of stuff. And then also on top of that, it's like it ends up feeling a bit trivial at some point too, where you're like, yeah, you know, you're building like uh, more social housing, but like that you know that like you when you vote, it doesn't matter much because like people can just you know, flow in millions of dollars if, if anything was about to change and uh, just totally wreck your operation. 
either through the money or just through like police killing a leader or something like that or something, you know, like just, yeah. it's a, uh, and they might even appreciate yeah. some of the work you do. Like if you're building social housing, they might look at that as like, I, I, like, I think the way that this may work is like the whole, all that really basic boring type of stuff, housing and like grocery stores and, and that kind of stuff is just like infrastructure for this game on top. Sure. You know? Yeah. So like they may appreciate like, Oh, these, these are kind of like uh idealist, like people are, are doing this stuff to kind of like take care of these, uh, these drones or whatever. So that they can keep like, uh, just, they can spend their lives working on, on this sort of basic stuff that allows us to play our game, you know? Sure. Yeah. And it also reminded me of like, uh, when Margaret Thatcher, I guess in private notes and discussions and stuff, um, that have come out like her sort of viewpoint of the end of the cold war, uh, as it was sort of evolving was that they had to sort of stabilize the Soviet union, you know, because they thought that like collapse of the Soviet union might be catastrophic. Um, so, uh, you know, privately, I mean, publicly, obviously, uh, in the eighties, she's going around going like, you know, uh, we need, you know, the empire needs to collapse and all that kind of stuff and being very right wing. And then sort of privately, she's very, being very sort of realist about it where it's like, it's much better to have like a weak Soviet union limping along, uh, where the state has integrity enough that it can stop, you know, rogue generals and all that kind of stuff, Mm -hmm. you know, or like, yeah, or, uh, it can basically keep the system, you know, going along kind of thing. So it's like this but architecture they're like of, yeah. Weak enough to be uh, kind of controlled and, and harmless, sure. you know, like unthreatening. Yeah. And that doesn't make sense in a thing, like a sort of socialist viewpoint that is, uh, you know, too simplistic. Like you can't, you know, you can't, you can't imagine a situation where, uh, a, a socialist state could be useful to right, the capitalist right. system. I, I and, think that's what happened yeah. in, like during the Sy- the Syrian war when that was like the big thing. I think that kind of broke some people's brains and they weren't able to like process the, uh, like it, it seems like people of all kinds of different political persuasions and stuff, they had to warp the reality that they were seeing to kind of fit their schema you know, and it, there was like a, a real lack of like an ability to really understand what was happening. And I'm not claiming I understand it at all, but I, I, I think it was pretty apparent to anyone who was sort of like uh, paying attention that people were not, unable to understand anything outside of like, oh, it's regime change. It was like all references to like prior things like, oh, this is, we've seen this before. Um, and yeah, I think we have maybe seen things like that before, but I think that the things that people were referencing were not correct. I don't think that they relate it. Like, uh, I, I think the uh, kind of like the U.S. and Israel and these types of countries, um, they they preferred to keep Assad in, uh, but they were happy to see the the country just kind of like burn, you know. Um, Mm -hmm. but they didn't want it to actually have a change of government. You know, I don't, I don't think that they were, you know, the Syrian government has not been like a real thorn in the backside of like Israeli colonization or U S interests, like in a real way, you know? Yeah. Uh, same thing with like Libya, like uh, Iraq, like Hussein, you know, the, the, uh, it's similar sorts of situations where it's like the, these people are not, um, like sworn enemies to each other in that sense, you know, like they probably don't like each other very much, you know, like I'm talking about like say Saddam Hussein and like the U S but they're, you know, they know how to make deals. All these people know like when it's in their interest to make a deal with somebody that they don't like and they do it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, I might keep reading this and, uh, do like a more in-depth report on, uh, exactly what it uh, talks about like he actually goes into like the advocacy for libertarianism 
um, and how that is connected to a lot of these same people and, and stuff. And so it's pretty, yeah, I don't know, wide ranging, like look at this stuff. It gets into all kinds of, uh, things and it, it. I don't know. I like these kind of things that are able to tie a lot of different things together in a way that sort of, uh, makes, makes them all more significant, makes it all kind of mean more because mm-hmm. you can see how it's related to like other things. Sure. So, yeah. Yeah, it sounds interesting. Okay, so, yeah, I guess we'll get into questions now. Let's see, this first one says, I'm a Methodist from Texas wanting to start a podcast. Do you know a Canadian Shia convert who can be my co-host? We will do questions at the beginning of the episodes. Mm. Canadian Shia converts. I... I don't know any Shia converts. I know there's like some guy on Twitter who is a Shia convert, but I don't know him personally, and uh, I don't know if he's Canadian. Is that more rare, do you think? It seems like, uh, yeah, it seems like uh, most converts don't uh, become Shia for whatever reason. And I feel like the ones who do, it's sort of a political type decision. Like they seem to be um, more into the... uh, kind of like anti-imperialist politics type deal before they convert okay. and then they end up converting and um kind of gravitate towards the shia thing okay so like fans of hezbollah and stuff like that I guess. yeah that kind of thing which is uh i don't know whatever do <laughs> do your thing <laughs> but sure. that seems uh doesn't doesn't make a lot of sense to me mm-hmm. like i don't think modern politics should have that strong an influence on your religious choices but do your thing Mm -hmm. anyway um yeah good luck finding one um next one is uh does shadow donald smoke cigarettes hmm probably yeah i guess we don't know for sure yeah but it seems like something he'd do would would shadow donald use the computer Oh, you think he'd be, like, an anti-computer guy? Maybe. I don't know. Writes down little quips on, like, a on like a notepad, like on a post-it, and just sticks it up in public somewhere? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, why have you stayed silent on 9-11? What have you got to hide? Yeah, we haven't done any real 9-11 focused stuff. I mean, I guess we've sort of talked around it a little bit. Uh, but not like uh, what is our belief or take on 9-11 is it an inside job and all that kind of stuff have you ever dug into that kind of stuff or not not very far not really I don't know Um, it's probably a significant thing to if you're able to actually arrive at some kind of conclusion I imagine that's pretty important but I don't know for some reason it sort of uh, does not strike my interest too much i'm kind of open to whatever uh i I, i'm generally sort of on the side of like skepticism about too far out theories but i don't think it would be too crazy like for something to be like a let it happen on purpose type deal you know Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i mean i just i have i have no idea i don't know i i've heard a lot of people pointing out like little strange things that happened in the lead up and stuff. Um, yeah. But I don't know. To me, it's, it, it doesn't, I guess it, you know, it's obviously like a major event in that, like it led to a lot of other things. And like, it also uh, was sort of like, you know, giant explosions in the sky and buildings collapsing and stuff. So that's, you know, you're going to get a lot of attention that way anyways, but like, uh, but, like, it doesn't really seem distinct to me from a lot of other weird stuff that happens all the time kind of stuff. You yeah, know I mean? like it's like, that's the thing like for me. Yeah. There's, some, there's some aspect to it where it's kind of, like, mundane at this point or something. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it, any, any of those, like, oh, well, it started the Great War on Terror type thing. Well, did that mean they needed to do that in order to start? Like, it, I feel like a lot of those explanations are fall kind of short of making complete sense like it, it seems like it's a lot to do just to kind of justify 
a law that you probably can get past, you know, or without that, or like start a war or whatever. That that's always been the kind of the thing my go to is like people say like, oh, it was to start a war uh, in Iraq. Well, they certainly used it as like pretext for the war in Iraq, but does that mean that they like initiated the entire event from the start and like orchestrated the whole thing just to go to war. Like, I feel like there's easier ways of doing that. Sure. Yeah. That like, don't involve like destroying the world trade. Like that's kind of a lot to ask, you know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. Like if you're an American or whatever to, to do that. So yeah. I, but that being said, I almost, uh, I'm, I'm almost a hundred percent confident that the, like the official story is, uh, falsified in some way, you know. Sure. That there there is something going on there that we're we're not really being told. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. There's all kinds of like funny, uh, like, kind of wacky theories and stuff that if there was somehow uh, proof of it would come out or something, I would just be like, I knew it, I knew it all along. Like I just have this feeling about like all kinds of things. I don't quite believe them but i don't really disbelieve them and then all it would take is like one little thing and be like i knew it i i knew it the whole time <laughs> yeah yeah sure and 9-11 is one of those things where it's like okay the final piece came in and clicked and now like it all kind of made, makes sense but just haven't like come across that i guess mm-hmm. uh next question is who is tom's favorite living muslim convert mine is the english trans lady who wears a hijab for clout um, I mean, the first ones that pop into my head are, uh, two sheikhs, uh, Abdul Hakim Murad, AKA Tim Winter and Hamza Yusuf, uh, Zaid Shakir, uh, Omar Farouk Abdullah. I like all those guys. They're all converts. They're all Americans. Um, well, no, actually take that back. Abdul Hakim Murad is British, but the rest are Americans. Uh yeah, I, those would those would top my list, I guess. Of course, mm-hmm. uh, the third mic, beloved third mic, agile tablet has to slot in there somewhere. Sure. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I uh, I've listened to some of Hamza Yusuf's lectures before, and I I enjoyed them. So I don't know. I'll take that. I'll uh, I'll pick uh, him cool. for uh, my choice. Yeah. Um, converts can be very cool or they can be very weird. It's sort of a crapshoot. So it's always a little bit of like, oh, you converted too, huh? Okay. And then you sure. need to get to know them a little bit before it's like, all right, you're all right. Because, mm-hmm. uh, I don't know. There are all kinds of people that are into this stuff. Anyway, uh, next question is shit posting on LinkedIn is a hot trend. Will you join in? I'm never going to join LinkedIn, man. That's not not gonna happen um i joined it a few years ago well maybe like five years ago or something that's or something and uh was using it sort of like you know trying to figure out how to uh apply to jobs and all that kind of stuff and really it just uh scared me more than anything i just you know be looking around at stuff and it's like uh it really is like number one all it is like jobs careers are all just like video games now basically like it's just like you 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 set up your page like it's a dating profile basically and yeah that's like weird get get all the you know like you can get all the accredita- accreditations or whatever you know like all the different little certificates and stuff you can like sort of integrate them into your profile in different ways and um there's all like the headhunters coming around looking for people and stuff and all the different like organizations have their own groups and stuff. So you can like join, you know, like all the different groups for different employee groups and stuff. And it it does feel like, you know, like a half dating website, half Twitter kind of thing for things. And uh, so eventually I deleted it because I was like, I don't know, that's very strange. I don't know. Um, I get why it might be useful if you're sort of playing that game, but yeah. Yeah, did you see any shit posting? Um, I uh, I did not see much of that. No, but uh, um, I, you know, I don't know. 
I feel like it's too dark of a place to do it. Like no one goes on Gab <laughs> and does that as much. I mean, I'm sure there are people that do, but like, you know, it's just sort of like a, I don't know. Yeah. Like even like Facebook now, like trolling Facebook is sort of like, you know, people believe that like all sorts of things now. So it's like, it doesn't even, you know, like tricking someone into believing something on Facebook. It's like, okay. Yeah. But like, yeah, the real things they believe are crazier than anything <laughs> you can like, come yeah, up with. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, the joke's, like, already done in reality. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was that question the other episode. I think maybe last episode or the one before or something, someone asked if God was a troll, and that's uh, strong evidence in the positive True. direction. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, does Ronaldo's allegations make it difficult to root for him, or do you not think about it at all? All right, I have no idea about this. I don't know what the allegations are. I assume it's sexual assault for reasons that I think are obvious. And uh, I don't think about it because I don't really care about soccer. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not really. I tried a little bit to get into soccer. I'm going to try a little bit here and there to like, you know, like if I'm in Montreal or something like that, I might go to one of their soccer games or something. Is soccer like, big there in Montreal? Uh, not really, but like... Uh, the whole major league soccer seems to have taken off yeah, uh, in the last five years or so. And, uh, so like the payrolls for the teams are pretty big and, uh, you know, like if you're like one of the top players in the league, you can, you can make millions of dollars. And, uh, I thought like, I honestly thought it was one of those things where like they give you like a free bus ticket or something like that kind of thing. But like, you know, it, yeah, it's pretty, pretty well paid now. So that's credibility in my mind. So I don't know, like, uh, I, I could see going to a game here or there or something like that. So, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Soccer, like I used to play it when I was a kid, but watching it always seemed really boring, which, um, yeah. you know, I know a lot of people say that about baseball, but I love watching baseball uh, as well as playing it. So I, I don't know. There's not as much to think about it with soccer, I guess. With baseball, like every little, every pitch, every, every like play is there's a lot to think about what's happening i guess so that kind of yeah i can understand why that would be boring to people if they're not watching it like so intently and uh, uh yeah i guess that, that makes things like soccer more more kind of like interesting i guess i uh i bought fifa 21 whatever and um uh my only thing with that is that i uh um i you know, I, I play it on very easy and just get like 10 goals a game against, against the opponent kind of thing. You know, just like crush them just for fun. And uh, mm-hmm. I don't know. It's it's okay. I like it. Yeah. Got to start calling you easy mode Donald. Do everything on easy yeah. mode. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember playing some FIFA like a few years ago. It was pretty fun. Uh, but I understand like they've kind of like turned it into a like a big like the online uh like the dlc type things like the pay to play sure. type yeah. stuff has become a big part of it so that kind yeah. of sucks i just i don't do any of that stuff so yeah it you know it's fine for me who needs it on easy mode right sure <laughs> okay uh next one says how you so cute how we so cute don um i don't know we uh yeah i don't know we uh commit to it every day i guess yeah i think that's just god's light shining on our faces sure um are you related to bindi johal i don't know who that is sounds like an indian name or something Mm Mm-hmm. i have no idea gangster from british columbia uh self-confessed drug trafficker known for outspoken nature and blatant disregard for authority in 1998, was fatally shot in the back of the head at a crowded nightclub in Vancouver. Hmm. Okay. Fair enough. I guess he had one of the most expensive trials in Canadian history. You never heard of this guy? No, I'm not sure. He's, I think I, I, I'm not. Yeah, I haven't. I guess he's a Punjabi yeah. Canadian. I wonder if this person sent this question in for Big Dave. Oh, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, he's probably related. They're all, you know, big families. Fair enough. Yeah. 
Uh, okay, next one says, As much as I think Islam is completely antithetical to the West, we gotta hand it to you, Mohammedans, the one time you guys saved the white race at the Battle of Ain Jalut, defeating the extremely destructive Asiatic Mongol hordes with their Armenian, not white, in Georgia, perhaps a little more white allies. Okay, thanks for that, friendly neighborhood white supremacist. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Appreciate it. Yeah, that's that's nice. That's better than the ones where they just shout race traitor and all that kind of stuff, whatever. It's more like, you know, we can always find ways to work together. Yeah, yeah. Uh, next one, another one about Punjabis. Yeah, so I think I'm getting into the Big Dave questions here, but it says Punjabis are the her- heron folk. Uh, so I guess I said something like that, like that they were the original Aryans or something when we were talking mm-hmm. about that. Uh, I have no specific position on who the Heron Volk are, but uh, I think Punjabis can throw their hat into the ring, you know? Let the people decide. Why not? Not even mm-hmm. sure what that is, to be honest. Sure. Uh, how was it growing up in the 80s? Was it uncomfortable riding a dinosaur? Well, I was born in 87, so I think I get to escape this burn. This one's all on you, Don. Yeah, I was born in 81. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's strange. I, I feel like uh, in retrospect, there was a lot less technology than uh, we sort of, like everything now that I look back at it, like like all the phones were like rotary phones kind of thing where you like put your finger in and then swing it around kind of thing to so just dial one number at a time kind of thing. Mm-hmm. The TVs, I was thinking this the other day, TVs, you would have to, like, smack them a lot to get them to work, kind of thing. That was, like, a big thing. Yeah. Like, and it was, like, a very standard thing, and to get, you have to, like, tune it right and stuff, and um, a lot of black and white TVs still, they were just, like, around. Um, like, video games came out, and, uh, you know, you would do things like blow on the cartridge to make it work and stuff, mm-hmm. and a lot of that, little things like that. Um, yeah, and, like, uh, food was completely different really there was like you know uh like like you know how everything's made of corn now it wasn't like that at the time um a lot of like uh you know just uh like restaurants there's way more fast food now Mm -hmm. just like there was fast food but it was like just like there's like five of them kind of thing you know yeah like now there's just like you know all the burrito places and you know Chinese and all that kind of stuff. Well, there was Chinese, but you know, you know what I mean. And uh, yeah, there's a lot more car- variety, yeah. like Thai food and you know all that kind of stuff. Cars were just like big tanks, kind of thing, a lot of the time, and uh, they uh, they weren't like completely sealed, even kind of thing. You know, like now it's kind of like you're in like a, it's almost like a little airtight little container and stuff. Like you would have to like roll down the window, like with the um, you know, a little handle mm-hmm. and that wouldn't work sometimes and stuff. And, uh, like sometimes like the car would just end up smelling like smoke or like, like a exhaust inside and you'd be like, uh Oh, are we going to die or something like that? People would have like cars where like the floor would sort of erode or something with like, you know, break or something. So they, they had to have like sort of put tape on the bottom of their car and stuff so that like it wouldn't you know, it was it was a lot more like having like a beat up bike or something like that kind of thing than having like a, a thing. So I don't know. Th- those are those are some of my basic technological memories. So yeah, yeah, cool. It's so interesting to look back into. <laughs> <laughs> look uh, back. I remember uh, David from he, he was explaining why he hated the seventies. He has like a whole book about why he hates the seventies. And why, like, okay. neo, neo, neoliberalism was, like, basically the, the the solution to all of our problems. And one of the things he used to say was that, like, car doors wouldn't close right. And that's true. Like, it's one of those things where, like, things like that would happen a lot of the time. And, uh, I mean, you know, uh, the total pulverization of the poor and, like, just all the wrecking of people's lives in all different sorts of ways and mass Worth unemployment it. and rusting – there was some positives. There was like <laughs> stuff like that, like where, I don't know, just uh, very basic things you can kind of depend on more. Like, 
There was a lot of returning stuff. I don't know, like, if that's mm. as big a thing now. But yeah. you would just, like, get, like, TVs, and it would just get bring it home, and it wouldn't work. You, or you wouldn't have, like, half the cables or something. And you'd have to, like, just bring it back. And it was, like, a huge hassle to do that. Walmart sort of revolutionized that in some ways, where, like, you just bring it back, and they're like, well, whatever. And you're like, I don't have a receipt. And they're like, well, that's fine, kind of thing or something. You know, just, like, really wild return policies. Yeah, Amazon well, like, kind of uh, does that now, I guess. Yeah. And... uh but before you had to like wait in a long line and like right. haggle with them basically and be like, you know, this receipt, they're like, oh, this receipt's, you know, two weeks old, so we're not going to take it and stuff like that, you know, like just psycho stuff. So, yeah. I was thinking the other day, like we have a, a lot of stuff, like it takes less time and effort than it used to, like things like that, you know, like just all yeah. kinds of stuff, just it's much easier to take care of you know, online or whatever it is. And, uh, it doesn't feel like we have any more free time though. I know I do. Sure. I have tons of free time, but it doesn't feel that way for some reason. I think there's like, it's easier to take care of little chores and stuff like that, but it's also, uh, there's just a lot more to fill your time with. And so like, sure. it doesn't feel like you have just like as much, time where you're not really doing anything there's like always something that even if it's like a like a fun thing you know like you want to watch a show or something like that like it it's there's just like always like a a big backlog to work through on things yeah and uh tv i guess is something completely different uh in mm. the past too where it was yeah. like uh well i mean the main thing probably from like young people is that like if something wasn't on if you missed it you just did you just didn't see it kind of thing right? right like if it's like you would like see simpsons on like eight o'clock or something on sunday or something or saturday or something something like that you know it would be on and uh if you missed it you're like wouldn't see it for like six months or something like that kind of thing right like it would just wouldn't come back on again until like they re did a re uh rerun what's that called rerun sorry yeah and uh and yeah stuff like that like uh so TV was weird where, like, everyone, like, felt like they had to watch it all the time. Like, you just had to sit there watching for, like, six hours a day or something like that kind of thing. Uh, but but you just sort of accepted the fact that there was only, like, maybe plausibly, like, five or six things that you could possibly watch that were on at the time. Like, there's only, like, a certain small number of things you could possibly even care about. And, uh, they, and it wouldn't even be, like, uh, you know... I'm not even saying, like, it'd be, like, five things that, like, you thought were, like, awesome shows or something like that. It would just be, like, things that weren't commercials or something like that right. kind of thing. It was, like, yeah. it was like we're going to watch, like, uh, uh, the TV show Coach or something like that. Or, like, you know. And, uh, yeah. So, that, that I think that was a big thing where, like, you just, you ended up watching, like, just hundreds of hours of TV that you thought were, like, just garbage yeah and, uh, and it just uh, like whatever lined up with your personal schedule would determine sure. a lot of like what you would end up watching too yeah yeah and yeah and then the rentals and stuff were all like vhs and stuff and mm -hmm. a lot of the times the tapes didn't work and you had to remember to rewind them and all that kind of stuff and yeah and uh yeah i don't know so it's weird now because uh our when I see people be like, I've run out of stuff to watch on Netflix and they mean that they've watched like thousands of hours of just total junk kind of thing. I'm just, I'm just blown away that they can do that. I'm just, I can't believe that you would do that. Cause I don't know. It's a, uh, it seems like a completely different world kind of thing where you could just watch whatever you want, whenever you want, basically. And then, uh, have to sort of sift through it and stuff. I don't know. I find that hard to manage still. So, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. Anyways. Um, okay. So this next one, I may not read this whole thing. Uh, it just says thoughts and then it's a quote and it says respecting reality and combining with the people are the characteristics and strengths of the CPC. Over the past hundred years, the CPC has continued to adapt Marxism to the Chinese context and the needs of the times Mao Zedong thought, Dao Xia, Deng Xiaoping theory, the theory of three represents, blah, 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 blah. Uh, yeah, so it goes on like this. Um, 
On the journey ahead, considering China's realities in contemporary times, the party will continue to adapt the basic tenets of Marxism to the best of China's traditional culture and use Marxism to observe, understand, and steer the trends of our times in the 21st century. So is this from a Xi Jinping speech or something? I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's it's strange that like people would take political i mean you kind of have to take it seriously at some extent but like it is funny to me how like i don't know it, 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 to me it'd be like getting excited about like a biden speech or something like that yeah. like i know i know they say if you listen to like a biden speech he's gonna say a lot of the words that you want to hear like he's gonna say i mean for me personally or something like that he's gonna say a lot of stuff about how climate change is one of the biggest problems in the world that we have to like you know we can't hold back. We got to go all out to fight it and stuff. He's going to say about like every worker deserves a good wage and we need to fight poverty and all that kind of stuff. He's going to say all that, but you kind of go, I think you have, you know, we're all cynical enough that we kind of go, Oh yeah, well, you know, probably not though. Right. Like probably, <laughs> probably not going to. So I don't know. It's the same thing where it's like, yeah, we just got all these banks and big businesses and stuff running your life. But like, uh, um, but we're going to keep implementing Marxism to uh, build a more prosperous society over the medium term or whatever kind of thing. You know, it's like, yeah, I mean, come on. Like, I don't know. If it is revolutionary, then that's pretty sad for revolution. I don't know. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a bunch of odd. It's odd because it's uh, the jargon and stuff is very different from like the expectations of an American politician. Um, yeah, and I think that's just because of, you know, the the, the political developments in China over the past century or so. That like this is what sure. you're supposed to say as like a leader and sure. all that kind of stuff. And it's, yeah, how oh, very different and yet somehow so the same. Sure. Um, yeah. So I can't get work too worked up about it either way. So yeah. Sure. All right. Well, we will wrap it up for this one there. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, if you want a second episode of You Can't Win Every Week, you can subscribe to our Patreon and you'll get that as well as access to our Discord where you can chat with us in our lovely community. If you want to send us anonymous questions that we answer at the end of the podcast, uh, you can do that by going to our Twitter account at You Can't Win Pod and there's a link to the Curious Cat there where you can send those in. Thanks for listening and we'll catch you next week. Thanks, guys. Bye.